Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's briefing on the national security case for a ceasefire. My name is Odelia Matter, the Program Assistant for Middle East Policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and I will be moderating today's panel. Co-hosting this briefing are our friends at Demand Progress, Middle East Democracy Center, and Churches for Middle East Peace. In our last briefing in the series, we had a fascinating presentation and discussion on a polling report carried out by the Institute for Social and Economic Progress on polling on wartime perspectives among Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. For the latest polling report carried out between June 1st and 6th, see the link uh, which will be sent in the chat in a, mo in a moment. Um, we have now reached over nine months of war in Gaza, which have caused severe devastation for both Palestinians and Israelis. By July 8th, OCHA reported 38,000 Palestinians killed in Gaza, with at least 10,000 more trapped under rubble. This amounts to over one in 50 of Gaza's 2.3 million residents dead or presumed dead. On October 7th, Hamas's brutal attacks killed over 1,200 Israelis and more than 115 hostages remain in Gaza. According to IDF sources, at least 320 soldiers have been killed since the war began. The war has also led to regional escalations that are intensifying daily, including Iran-backed militia attacks on US bases in Iraq, Syria, and Jordan, which killed three U.S. service members in January, Houthi attacks in the Red Sea that the U.S. has directly intervened in, and heightened tensions between Israel and Iran, the conflict on Israel's northern border with Hezbollah in Lebanon, where over 7,400 cross-border attacks have been exchanged and displaced tens of thousands of Israelis and Lebanese from their homes on either side of the border. These come with growing threats of an Israeli invasion into Lebanon, which General C.Q. Brown, chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, has cautioned would endanger American forces in the region and potentially provoke further involvement by Iran, escalating the conflict into a broader regional war with deadly consequences. The United States' involvement in the war in Gaza and these regional escalations both directly and indirectly, have provoked a negative impact on the U.S.'s reputation globally. Our panelists today are two established professionals who have dedicated their careers to U.S. national security. They will share why, based on their experience and expertise, an immediate ceasefire is necessary to bring an end to this humanitarian catastrophe and prevent a full-blown regional war involving the US, Israel, Hezbollah, and Iran. Our speakers are Hala Rarit, a career diplomat and former State Department spokesperson for the Middle East and North Africa, and Harrison Mann, former US ma uh, Army Major and Executive Officer of the Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA, Middle East Africa Regional Center. After answering a couple of questions, we'll proceed to a Q&A section where we'll be addressing questions sent via our registration form. If you have further questions, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom and we will try to address them. So first we'll hear from Harrison Mann, a former US Army Major and Executive Officer of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Middle East Africa Regional Center, who resigned in protest of his office's support for Israel during its Gaza campaign. He previously served as a Middle East all-source intelligence analyst and led a crisis cell coordinating intelligence support for Ukraine. Prior to DIA, he worked at the U.S. Embassy Tunis Office of Security Cooperation and led Army civil affairs teams combating regional smuggling under U.S. Naval Forces Central Command in Bahrain. Harrison began his Army career as an inf infantry officer. He received a BA from the College of William and Mary and a Master in Public Administration from the Harvard University uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government. So Harrison, you've had extensive experience within the US military and defense intelligence agency covering a range of national security and intelligence issues in the Middle East region. 
Could you please give us an overview of what you think the national security case is for a ceasefire and dive into specific new risks for U.S. personnel and wider regional instability or stability or instability as a result of the continuing war and the U.S.'s support for it? Absolutely. Thanks, Adelia. And uh, thank you to all of you for, for joining us this morning. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of want to walk us from where we are today to how we get to uh, the risk of many more dead Americans, as well as many more dead Palestinians, Lebanese and Israelis, because that is a potential path that we're on. Um, before I kind of go down that timeline, I just want to set some some basic facts which I, I've realized talking to a lot of different people over the past past couple of weeks, not everybody always thinks of. Um, I think the most important one is to understand that um, all of the actors that we're dealing with here, and this is not a moral judgment, are here to stay. State of Israel is not going anywhere. Hamas is not going anywhere. Hezbollah is not going anywhere. Uh, the Houthis are not going anywhere. Uh, and by that, I mean... There is no force in the region or in the world, including the United States, that has the capability and the will uh, to defeat the military capabilities of any of these actors or apply enough force to compel them uh, to, to bend to another's will. Uh, the I think the exceptions of that, uh, unfortunately, is that if, if Israel deprives Gaza of food and medicine for long enough, the effect of that will also include Hamas, which is to say if, if there was nobody left alive in the Gaza Strip, that is one way to get rid of Hamas. But short of that, nothing's going to do it. Uh, nothing would dislodge uh, Hezbollah or the Houthis short of, well, I think nothing would do it. And, and just to understand what that might take, Israel can't do it. It would be a nation with the capabilities of the United States of America doing a Iraq or Afghanistan uh, level of intensity invasion and occupation, which I don't think is likely, but I just emphasize that uh, to show that regardless of your moral judgments of any of the people we're dealing with here, they're not going anywhere. And I've seen both Israeli and American leaders really hope that we can get rid of Hamas, we can get rid of Hezbollah, but that's not going to happen. And the, the other reason I'm emphasizing this is that no matter how much violence and, and bloodshed is instigated, the, the end state is not going to look dramatically different than, than where we've been. The threats that all the actors perceive are still going to be there. So there can be a lot of fighting and a lot of killing, but, but in the end, nobody... Um, including the Israelis, including us, is really going to feel safer for it. Uh, the other thing I want to I give by way of context is just kind of where we are in the story, some upcoming events. I know you are all very well aware of Netanyahu's visit to Congress on the 24th, um, right? We see that as his chance, one, to try and to give his best shot at making sure Trump wins the election, because that's the preferred outcome for him. And I think more importantly, in the short run, uh, to be fully confident that he has American support no matter what he does in the future. This is his, you know, I don't think that the Biden administration has been withholding of, uh, of really support in a significant way, but this is a chance to talk to the, the rest of the U.S. government, to the rest of Congress, and make sure that whatever Biden says, he knows that arms and intel and other forms of U.S. support will be forthcoming no matter what he does. A few days after that uh, is the beginning of recess for the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, for about three months. That's really basically the, the last chance, and I don't think it's that likely now, for the Israeli legislature to try and replace or oust Netanyahu. Uh, Knesset gets back in session at the very end of October. And y'all know what happens at the very beginning of November in the United States, which is all to say uh, we are very close to the Israeli prime minister getting to a place where he no longer has to worry about accountability from the United States, and he no longer has to worry about a lot of accountability mechanisms from his own government. So uh, with that understanding, let's, let's go into how uh, this escalates. Um, right now, 
we have three three big parties. I mentioned the Houthis, but they're they're a little bit ancillary here. Uh, Israel, Hamas, and Hezbollah. All of them feel different pressures. Uh, Hamas at this point. Uh, actually, uh, kind of in, a, in an unexpected development for me, said they were amenable to a ceasefire deal that's not permanent. And this just happened in the past couple of days, um, even though they've been a willing to incur or risk incredible civilian suffering. I guess they're either feeling it or they they took Qatar's threat to get booted out of Qatar seriously. And so they've conceded a little bit. Hezbollah um, also has never wanted war and has never wanted escalation. And they've, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the secretary general of Hezbollah, has been explicit about that from November through his remarks yesterday, I believe. And he said it really explicitly yesterday. As soon as uh, Hamas gets a ceasefire that they're happy with, Hezbollah will stand down, no questions asked. But they, they, they're an organization that's founded to resist Israel. So he cannot fully stop firing stuff at Israeli positions and firing stuff into northern Israel until there's a ceasefire. And so where, where we are today is, in addition to having an Israeli prime minister who has personal motivations to continue the war, even if somebody much more reasonable and cooperative than Netanyahu was in his place, I don't think there's any Israeli government that would find it acceptable that they've got tens of thousands of people evacuated from northern Israel because of Hezbollah fire. That's not a tenable situation um, for any Israeli government, forget, you know, Netanyahu's uh, personal characteristics. So that means that they have to find a solution to this. The really easy solution is a ceasefire, which we will know will make Hezbollah stand down. Um, the other solutions, and I, let's let's revert back to the first statement I said, which is that there's no way to really defeat Hezbollah. The other solutions are what I'm going to talk about now. The Israeli defense leadership, and again, this is a separate from Netanyahu thing, their their traditional strategic thinking is that their biggest existential threat is Hezbollah. It's why they almost launched a preemptive strike on Hezbollah right after October 7th. And even though they, they have an understanding of the, they have some understanding of the cost to Israel from that war, um, they have seen before October 7th as this is an inevitable conflict. We have to get rid of Hezbollah once and for all for the, the security of Israel, which again is not realistic. Right now, their way to deal with this has been a, a slowly accelerating escalation back and forth with his with uh, with Hezbollah, mostly staying in the border area. And that's not deterring Hezbollah, and that's not making the the attack stop. So really the only the only remaining ways for Israel to escalate, which I think are both on the table for them, are bombing uh, Beirut, which is another part of their strategic thinking, the Dahia doctrine, that if they, while they can't strike all of these dug-in Hezbollah positions that they're shooting rockets from, they can blow up the areas that Hezbollah controls politically and where the headquarters operates out. That's one option. Either in concert with that or after with that is a ground invasion which in theory is really the only way to root out people who have tunnels and, and dug in positions in mountains and caves like Hezbollah does. It won't be effective, but it will be more effective than what they're doing now. And so the way I see this proceeding, especially since the US has promised that we will support them no matter what, current approach is not working. Israel then bombs Lebanese, deeper into Lebanon, civilian areas. Hezbollah has refrained from deliberately targeting Israeli civilian areas, but when Beirut starts getting bombed, as they did in 2006, there's a good chance that they will attack both uh, civilian and military targets, or at least civilian infrastructure. At that point, the Israelis really have no other option than to launch a ground invasion, because again, bombing Beirut is not going to stop the attacks. When this happens, uh, Hezbollah is going to feel much more threatened than they do now. And at some point, they're going to abandon their policy of basically escalating by the bare minimum that they have to. They have an incredible arsenal of precision weaponry, which they did not have in 2006, when they also soundly beat the IDF. That means all of Israel is at risk, both civilian and military infrastructure, airports, seaports, military bases, power infrastructure, which Israeli officials have warned could be very easily knocked out. 
the Israeli ground offensive is not really going to go that far, I think, because it's very hard to fight with your tired army through mountainous terrain to root out these Hezbollah forces, which are highly motivated and very well trained. Where this gets really worrisome for us as Americans, beyond our humanitarian concerns, is the Israeli troops in Lebanon are going to be suffering and incurring defeats, which are going to be highly televised and, and posted online by Hezbollah. The Israeli homeland is also going to be enduring a level of destruction that I think, frankly, it's it's never seen in all of Israel's history. Country without power. Rockets and missiles falling not just in the north, but in Tel Aviv, in Haifa. When we're in this position, uh, I, I, the Israelis, any Israeli leadership, Netanyahu, but really any Israeli leader is going to be loudly and publicly demanding for increased American support beyond just munitions, probably beyond just, you know, we, we could surge air defense uh, assets to the region, both by sea or, or on land, but that's not going to cut it. We've already said that Hezbollah's arsenal can overwhelm Israeli air defenses, can probably overwhelm whatever we can surge to the region as well. That edges us closer and closer to the point where the U.S., from Hezbollah's point of view, looks like a direct combatant, not just a, a supporting force in this conflict. That is incredibly dangerous. That makes all of our forces in the region a target. They've already been the target to the Houthis and to uh, Iran-backed militias in Iraq and Syria. Um, but Hezbollah is obviously much more powerful and much more capable. So what Americans are at risk, we have all of these small bases scattered around Iraq and Syria, which have basically always been understood by multiple administrations as cannon fodder. That's why those soldiers died in Tower 22 in Jordan. And there were many more who nearly died in Iraq and Syria since October 7th began. Um, those forces are going to become under increased attack. That's kind of a given. Our larger bases in the Gulf states are also relatively vulnerable and are not necessarily set up to, to defend against, again, a, a barrage of missiles and rockets. So the idea that Hezbollah could land a hit on our forces in Bahrain, in Saudi, in Jordan, and Qatar is pretty feasible. I can see I'm I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to add a little bit more to some of the some of the concerns here. Um, as we've already seen with our our efforts to fight the Houthis, one one potential outcome of this is that all of our Gulf partners in the region are probably going to demand that we we not use any of their bases to do strikes on Hezbollah because they're worried about. Um, Revenge from Hezbollah, Iran, and the Houthis. I think that's almost certain. That means we're now launching our air operations from carriers or from our bases in Europe, Spain, Italy, and Greece. Carriers, this, is, this has been long theorized and we haven't put it to the test, but we're about to, are potentially very easy targets for forces that have small boats and drones and asymmetric means. Similarly, you know, we've already seen uh, Hassan Nasrallah threaten Cyprus if Israel launches operations from Cyprus against uh, against Hezbollah and the result of that escalation. I don't know how long, uh, again, Israel, Spain, and Greece would be willing to endure that kind of risk so that we can fight Hezbollah on behalf of Israel, which is just to add that even our military response if we try to do strikes on behalf of Israel, which is where I think this could eventually be headed, will be impeded and will put our partners and treaty allies in the region at risk. The, uh, the, the last item I want to note is Iran's side of this. Iran, like Hezbollah, has been very clear that it does not want to escalate. It does not want any more war. But I think once this starts... Both Israel and almost probably eventually the U.S. are going to start striking supply lines in Syria and Iraq that are going to Hezbollah, coming from Iran, which increases the odds that we're not just hitting local militias in Hezbollah, but we're hitting Iranian IRGC, Iranian operatives, which is going to compel Iran to more directly and openly start striking stuff in the U.S. So I don't think I have time to go to entirely to how this leads to us directly fighting Iran, but Iran getting sucked in is very likely and very easy. Uh, with, with one minute left, I can say that after the dust settles on all of this, 
we are not going to be safer. A lot of Israel will be burning. Obviously, a lot of Lebanon uh, will be burning. Um, and even though Israel will have to divert forces from the Palestinian territories to do the ground offensive against uh, against Lebanon, um, this is probably almost certainly going to be an opportunity for the right wing Israeli government to further cleanse both Gaza and the West Bank, knowing that American and global attention is diverted to the war in Lebanon. So I'll leave it there. Uh, happy to answer many more questions later. Wow, Harrison, uh, thank you so much um, for laying out this potential trajectory and pointing towards, I, I believe, quite the urgency of a ceasefire to prevent this unfolding of events and, um, frankly, bloodshed. Um, next, we'll hear from Hala, Hala Rarit, a former career American diplomat with specialization in the Middle East. Hala joined the Foreign Service in 2006 as a political officer. Some of her tours include political and human rights officer at the U.S. Embassy in Sana'a, Yemen, deputy chief of the political economic section of the U.S. Embassy in Doha, Qatar, and political economic chief at the U.S. consulate in Durban, South Africa. In her most recent role, she was the face of the U.S. government in the Middle East as Arabic language spokesperson for the State Department based at the regional media hub at the U.S. consulate in Dubai, UAE. She also has deep experience in counterterrorism and countering violent extremism, having worked extensively on those files as an American diplomat. Hala has a master's degree from Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service and an undergraduate degree in international relations and Middle Eastern studies from George Washington University's Elliott School. Um, Hala, as a career diplomat and spokesperson in the MENA region, would you be able to walk us through your national, your national security case for a ceasefire? Um, also, given your experience, what have been the consequences of U.S. participation in this war, especially when it comes to the stability of the region and the U.S.'s reputation? Thank you so much, Odalia. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, so as you heard very clearly from Harrison, uh, we are so concerned about the trajectory, obviously about what's been happening. Uh, but to be clear, the reason why we resigned is because of everything that Harrison is outlining and everything that I will outline. Uh, I want to stress that it is not an us versus them, this side versus that side narrative. It is a matter of, is a policy winning? Is a policy successful or is it a failed policy? What is it doing to the United States? What is it doing to our allies? And as a diplomat for 18 years, uh, especially serving in the Middle East, I was witnessing day after day how much this policy was not only a failure, but it was endangering US national security. So as Adelia mentioned, I was most recently a spokesperson for the State Department based out in Dubai, and my role was regional. So part of that, I was monitoring the entire uh, Arab pan-Arab media landscape and social media. And I was documenting back to the State Department on a daily basis, the rhetoric that was happening across the Arab world. There has been such an increase in anti-American sentiment at an unprecedented level. And I want to stress this. I joined in Yemen at the height of Gitmo when the most amount of detainees were Yemenis. I was a human rights officer. I myself was evacuated twice out of the embassy in Tana'a, bombed three times. This is nothing. That was nothing compared to now. The level of anti-Americanism has grown to the extent where no one believes us anymore. And I'll tell you why. This has been the most graphic conflict, I think, of our lifetimes, right? Iraq was devastating. Syria was devastating. People have been killed throughout conflicts. But this one has been very different in the way that it's been visual. Everything has been visual. People have been live streaming this conflict every single day on their phones. And for the Arab world, for much of the world, to be quite frank, but particularly for the Arab world, that has been dramatic and traumatic. Uh, and people see direct US complicity in that. So what I was monitoring and sending back to the department were videos and pictures of children being 
appeared with U.S. bomb fragments next to them. So our U.S. complicity is undeniable. What is not being shown on American media and what I want you all to be aware of is the ramifications of this. There are protests in the Arab world on a daily basis. The United States is not aware of these protests. These protesters now across the Arab world are raising Hamas flags in countries like Morocco, in countries like Tunisia, which were never, ever pro-Hamas. They didn't even know who Hamas was, to be quite honest, because they were so remote from the conflict. And these are secular Arab countries that had no Islamist leaning, especially not in a popular sense. So this policy has had the absolute counter effect of its intended goal. It has emboldened extremists uh, in every way, shape, and form on both sides of the aisle. Why do these protests matter? I was in the State Department during the Arab Spring when all of a sudden the Arab world erupted and we in the U.S. government said, wait a minute, where did this come from? How did this happen? What is happening? We are there now. And it is not only a threat to the region, but it is a threat to us as well because we are directly implicated. People across the region have lost all faith and credibility in us. And when I say that, I will even say that it is worse than I've ever seen it before, including Iraq, including Syria. It was never easy to be an American diplomat in the Middle East, never, right? We've always had issues, but there were always people across the Arab world that still wanted the United States, that still loved American news. Hala, you are freezing momentarily. Hala, can you hear oh, me? Did I, lose, did I lose you guys for a second? Yes, but you're back. Oh, oh. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, so I was saying there were always people across the region that still admired the United States, despite all of the political issues. But now when we are seen as killing children, and this is a point that I really want to stress, this has been the most graphic point that there have been so many visual images of children getting killed and we're seen as absolutely heartless in the fact that we're enabling the killing of these children and the starvation of these children, right? We, our complicity cannot be denied. Uh, so we've lost them there. The implication, the protests across the Arab world are destabilizing to, uh, so there's the growing anti-Americanism, but they're also destabilizing to all these Arab leaders. And I'm gonna be quite blunt here. These are our leaders, right? These are a lot of our allies. These are the, the King of Jordan, the King of Morocco, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Egypt. These are our dictators for lack of a better word. Uh, so parrot out the trajectory of war and bloodshed and how everyone loses in that category. And now I'm bringing you even broader Arab world. What happens if all of these countries, all of these countries start destabilizing in themselves? So just this week, there were massive protests in Morocco, which prior to this conflict, there were, you know, things were, there's anti-corruption issues and all, but social cohesion, everything was sort of going as it should have been going. So where does that leave us? Our credibility is completely undermined. We have, we are losing Arab street, Arab leaders are in jeopardy and the policy continues to fail. One point that we want to stress is there is another path forward. As Harrison mentioned at the very top, it's stopping the bloodshed. It's stopping the violence. It's stopping the war. And the only way to do that is through a ceasefire. The reason why we have not been able to enact the ceasefire is because we have refused to use our leverage. And if you want to get your partners or even your enemies to do what you want them to do, you have to use your leverage. This administration has refused to, and specifically talking about military assistance, our continued, practically unconditional flow. And at this point, some 500-pound uh, bombs were released just recently again, so it's practically 
our unconditional flow of military assistance has enabled Prime Minister Netanyahu who, who to constantly undermine publicly President Biden. I mean, it's infuriating as a diplomat, former diplomat, it's infuriating to see the leader of another world, cons another country consistently undermining the president because he knows he's gonna get what he wants no matter what. Uh, so you have Biden coming out saying it's time for a ceasefire. Then you have a couple of days later Netanyahu coming out saying there's going to be no ceasefire. We have to use our leverage. And that's where I hope you all can do as much as you can to try to get us there. Another point on the military assistance and why it is so important to condition military aid for obviously achieving a ceasefire. One, it's on the Israeli side of actually putting pressure on on Netanyahu and on the Israeli government to, uh, to come to terms with a ceasefire, but also we have to give something to the Arab side. So Qatar and Egypt have been the mediators. They haven't had anything that they can pressure Hamas with as well, but we will gain significant credibility if we are able to leverage that military assistance that will give them ammunition to also pressure Hamas to come with concessions, to agree to concessions. One more point on the military assistance. Countries across the Arab world fully understand, as many of us in the government do, that we are willfully violating our own laws to continue funneling weapons. I'm sure some of you are aware with Lee vetting, with the Arms Export Control Act, the Foreign Assistance Act. We just had the National Security Memorandum uh, process. I, you may have heard of Stacey Gilbert, who resigned because uh, the, the facts were changed in that document in order to allow for continued military assistance to flow to Israel. So we are no longer a nation of laws in the eyes of many around the world. We're no longer law abiding because we are willfully violating our own laws in order to allow for continued military assistance. And to what end? What has this achieved? The only time that Israeli hostages were released was through a ceasefire. A large number were released was through a ceasefire. The families of hostages have been protesting for months against the Netanyahu government demanding a ceasefire. He is not listening to them. The generational cycle of violence. So Harrison talked about you can't defeat Hezbollah, you can't defeat Hamas. I'm going to take it to another level. Even if you could militarily defeat them, it does not matter because someone will serve again, unless you starve literally the entire population, someone will survive. And that someone will pick up a gun and have and, and try to seek revenge. There were countless images and videos that I sent back to the State Department of orphans, orphans throughout Gaza that would say, as, as soon as I am old enough to pick up a gun, I will pick one up and seek revenge. What do we expect from the population in Gaza now that has been starved, bombarded? The level of trauma is insane. And the longer it continues, the more difficult it will be to rehabilitate. There is an alternative path, and that is stopping this war as soon as possible, like we mentioned, leveraging our military assistance and our political cover. We have to stop protecting Israel politically, stop enabling them from violating international law, um, and we need to do it now. To be clear, this is not just me saying it. This is not just Harrison saying it. Uh, I'm sure you all saw back in, I think it was in March, CIA Director Burns and uh, Director of National Inter Intelligence as well, uh, Avril Haines, had a hearing in, at Congress where they talked about the growing national security threat, the fact that it will enable a growth of terrorism targeting the United States directly, uh, and most recently, this was also said by the top intelligence official at the State Department, as reported by the Washington Post. Government officials are saying it, not just us that have resigned and are on the outside. Our top intel officials are saying it. This policy is a threat to U.S. national security. 
it is a failed militaristic policy. And the only way out of it, the only way to avert an absolute disaster is to be able to end the war. And we have the ability to do that. We really do. But we need to act now, leverage the, uh, the military aid, get to a ceasefire, and hopefully you all can help get us there. Hala, thank you uh, so much for these insights on what um, I think is often undermined, which is the importance of the U.S.'s reputation and the implications of its decline on future foreign policy. Um, so I wanted to start with the question for both of you raised by a participant asking if a defense agreement with Saudi Arabia as part of a larger ceasefire deal would be harmful or helpful for the region and U.S. national security also given tensions with Iran and its allies in the region. And Halal ask you to expand um, a bit on how you think this will be received among Arab civil society and the public. I'll, uh, I'll jump in. Um, and, you, and you mean a US defense pact with Saudi. Yeah, I mean, that idea, it's kind of incomprehensible to me why we would benefit from it. I don't know. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is, as a country that has nothing to offer the United States in terms of defense, they cannot come to our aid. Uh, I don't know what we need from them that we're not already getting. Uh, and it would create the same kind of moral hazard that we not only see with Israel now, but also with Saudi Arabia itself. I mean, it, they they fought a really disastrous war in Yemen um, that was prolonged by by. U.S. support that at the beginning was kind of unconditional. Um, Mohammed bin Salman was quite chastened by that and is, is kind of no longer interested in adventurism. I think this would be the best way to give him the confidence to to start doing foreign military adventures again. So seems like a, you know, not not just a a big mistake, but I really don't understand how the United States would benefit in any way. Thank you. Yeah, Harrison. and I'll just. I'll, uh, I'll just add, to be quite blunt, it's delusional. And this is, as a spokesperson, I was told way before um, October 7th, I was told one of my main goals for later on in the year would be uh, Saudi-Israeli normalization, and that we'd be pushing that and we would be getting there. The Biden administration is still convinced that if Saudi and Israel normalize, that it will be a success for the region, that it will, you know, it will shepherd a brand new era. It's delusional. There's no such, there is no such reality other than in a few people's minds in the White House and perhaps Secretary Blinken. Anyone that is aware of what has been happening across the region knows that that one, that, is not going to happen. And two, this this is sort of the the carrot, you know, that that the administration is is presenting. Let's do this defense agreement with Saudi Arabia, and 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 we get some stability. Uh, no, it's not it's not going to work. Uh, one, Mohammed bin Salman has already publicly stated that any type of agreement would have to be met with a pathway to Palestinian statehood. He can no longer afford anything else. The anger across the Arab world is palpable and even he who is willing to chop up journalists is not willing to go as far as getting so much popular uh, support, lack of popular support going this way. Uh, it's ignoring the fundamental issues, which again is Palestinian self-determination, statehood. Those are the fundamental issues. This is not going to get us anywhere closer to that. And it's just a diversion tech, 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 tactic, really. And Biden wanted, we were told back in the day, Biden wanted this to be his legacy. Uh, but it's, it's not going to achieve anything. And it will not be met. In terms of your question, in terms of civil society, no, it, will, it, would, be, it would be a joke. And it will be seen as emboldening also an Arab dictator it would be seen, as Harrison mentioned, it would be seen as emboldening someone that is willing to suppress human rights, so on and so forth. Yeah, on, on that note, actually, we received another question um, that I'll ask you, Hala, which asked if the Abraham Accords 
contributed to current obstacles against um, a, a Palestinian statehood by bypassing Palestinian representatives? Look, I'll say I think the intent of it it was well intended, right? It was trying to get Arab states and Israel to become friends, normalize relations with the hopes that that would improve the situation. But Israel at the same time kept on oppressed. I mean, these are facts. You don't have, it's not my word. It's these are oppressing Palestinians, instituting apartheid, laws and systems within the West Bank, uh, emboldening the siege of Gaza, where even before people were rationing food and water, uh, you know, it was not sustainable. And the reality that, oh, as long as Israel is now friends with the UAE, things will be better is also delusional, just the same way that uh, if Israel becomes friends with Saudi Arabia, somehow you know, you don't have to worry about the millions of Palestinians that are living under either bombardment, starvation, or absolute oppression. Uh, it's it's a ticking time bomb, and it will continue to be a ticking time bomb until it is resolved, no matter what other ties are normalized between Israel and other Arab countries. And at this point, uh, those countries that have maintained normalized relations, those are the ones that are in most jeopardy. Like I was mentioning, Jordan, protests every single day. Morocco protests every single day because now those populations are saying, why, why do we have normalized relations with a country that is doing this to, to, to civilians, right? They're not seeing it as they're doing this to a terrorist organization. They're seeing this as they're doing it to civilians. They're killing children. They're starving babies. Um, and people are, people people have had enough of it and they're starting to rise up against their own leaders, which is which is quite destabilizing to the entire region. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and Harrison, uh, one question we received um, was about UNRWA. So can you speak to how the US defunding UNRWA and the trouble of humanitarian aid access could destabilize the region, um, not just Gaza? Yeah, and I'll see if Paula has anything to add because this is a little outside of my expertise. But there's there's Palestinian camps in Lebanon where they're they're a smaller proportion of the population and sort of more of a unwanted segment of society. And then there's a much larger Palestinian population um, that still benefits from UNRWA funding in Jordan. So just adding to what Paula said, uh, if if the king of Jordan didn't have enough problems already with his perceived support for Israel. Um, if he starts getting a, a segment of the, the Jordanian population there um, that is losing funding for, for education and foodstuffs, you know, I, I don't know if that's going to necessarily topple him, but it, it adds to destabilizing a key U.S. partner in the region. And uh, Lebanon, I would just say if we could find a way to somehow make this country, which basically doesn't have a functioning government right now, even at, at greater risk of some sort of collapse or civil war, then making the Palestinian population there more desperate would, would certainly be one way to contribute. Um, and, I'll, and I'll add a few points. So the reason, obviously, why we cut UNRWA funding is because of the Israeli government's allegation that UNRWA, members of UNRWA took part in October 7th. I'll be clear, nobody in the Arab world believes that allegation. Nobody, right? Uh, they see us as taking Israel's word uh, without proof, without any type of documentation, without any type of assessment. Uh, and they see it as us really enabling a genocide. So Whenever you watch Arab media, that is the only word that is used when referring to what's happening in Gaza, to be clear. They're seeing it as we are enabling the ethnic cleansing. We are on purpose trying to starve innocent Palestinian civilians. So beyond the actual mechanics of what will this do in terms of within, you know, within Gaza, the West Bank, Jordan, Lebanon, it also feeds into everything that we have been talking about. Uh, where we've lost an entire region. We've lost 420. I don't want to. I don't want to sound dramatic, right? I don't want to speak as a whole, but really, uh, 
it's it's this it's this willful like we're purposefully trying to hurt people and that's how we're seeing we're really we, we've really really been demonized uh, in an extensive way and and our defunding of UNRWA was was really critical in that uh, demonization of the United States so I'll just add that point thank you Hala um this question I believe is for Harrison uh someone shared the following question uh the interim Governance plan of the current ceasefire proposal calls for U.S. trained force backed by Arab allies to take over security of Gaza. Given the history of past U.S. interventions and proxy security force training, it's fair to be skeptical about this arrangement. So how can we mitigate the mistakes of the past while also ensuring security without either Hamas or Israel controlling the Gaza Strip? Yeah, and thanks to I think whoever asked that is referencing uh, the the last U.S. trained uh, security force in uh, in Gaza, which was kicked out by Hamas in in 2006 or 2007 uh, after some fighting. So we did try this before; it failed. I'll revert back to the the first thing I said, which is Hamas is not going anywhere. They're not, and so we can we can. It's feasible that we put some pan Arab, also any Palestinian Authority force that we put in there. Or you know, one of the plans I saw said moderate Arabs in in Gaza that Israel has vetted, they're going to be seen as uh, collaborators with Israel. So forget dealing with Hamas; that the population is not going to trust them. But best case scenario, we we can let's say we put some pan Arab force or some force of Palestinians who Israel's decided they approved of uh, in there. Anybody who goes there is going to be operating uh, at at the pleasure of Hamas. And their security and safety is going to be dependent on Hamas's acquiescence. Just they're on Hamas's home turf. So, you know, to, to answer the question in a productive way, if it could placate all the parties by putting some pan-Arab or approved Palestinian force there, and they're the people we talk to instead of Hamas, and they're the people the Israelis talk to instead of Hamas, we could do that. We just need to understand that they're not going to do anything that contradicts what Hamas wants, and they will be operating based off of the incentives of Hamas. Um, that's the best case scenario. Also, quite likely is that you know, whatever the, that force, uh, their 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 rifles and armaments end up in a Hamas bunker. So, if this is a politically feasible solution or politically palatable solution to put in a basically a superficial government or security force so that we can say that um, it's not Hamas. I think maybe maybe that's a good idea as long as we understand that just like sort of we when we deal with the government of Lebanon because we can't talk to Hezbollah directly, Hamas is still going to be there and they're still going to be the most important and influential force that does effectively control that strip of land. Can I just Adelia, yeah. can I just jump in just for just to, for a bit of historical context, uh, just to make sure that everyone is on uh, operating on the same page. The reason why we're in the situation that we're in today is specifically because of Israeli policies in terms of imprisoning any type of political leadership in 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 either Palestinian territory. Okay, this is not me saying it. This is prime, former Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Netanyahu has had for years, for decades, a systematic divide and conquer policy where he feared the Palestinian Authority because the Palestinian Authority was a party of nonviolent resistance, nonviolence, right? He thought that that would be more of an appeal to the West, and that was more of a threat. And then he funneled through Qatar, but this was a Netanyahu policy funneled millions and millions of dollars to Hamas. This is, again, not me saying it. This is the Israeli government saying it. Just YouTube it, Google it if you don't already know these historical facts, and I hope you know it. The Israeli government, the Israeli right, and most particularly Netanyahu, has propped up Hamas for decades. Decades. And has imprisoned any other type of moderate voice within Palestinian politics. And so some of those people that are on these lists of releasing these Palestinian prisoners are those political leaders, like Marwan Marhouti, like others, because there is no 
as Harrison is saying now, there's no one else, but there's no one else because it's been Israeli policy to ensure there's been no one else. And we, as the United States, have to stop enabling this policy. We have to stop allowing the Israeli government to conduct arbitrary arrests, to partition Palestinians, to continue taking land, because then we are stuck with only Hamas. This is this is the product, right? Emboldening extremists. This is this is this is the product. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, Arab pan Arab back, you know force. Uh, at the end of the day, it's going to have to be approved by the Palestinians, right? We are supposed to be a democratic country. We can't expect others to be okay with others governing them and ruling them. It's going to be up to them. And again, the only way out of this, the only way out of this is to ensure Palestinian statehood, is to ensure the Palestinians' right to serve determination. And so whether it's Hamas or anyone else, and it, it, that's in the leadership there, they're not going to have a need and a desire to try to attack Israel because their needs will have been met, which is a state of their own and a territory of their own where they're able to govern themselves freely. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Um, I will ask another question before we wrap up. Um, which uh, is, what do you think Congress can be doing to end the war? build towards lasting peace and mitigate the humanitarian disaster in Gaza. Okay, in one word, uh, cut and suspend arms. As Hala mentioned, Israel does whatever it wants because there is no credible threat that the US will withhold military aid. Congress theoretically has the ability to make that threat credible. Thank you, Harrison. Hala? Yeah and impose our own laws. That's it. Make the State Department abide by our laws, demand it. Dig deep into Leahy vetting, dig deep into the Arms Export Control Act. I, it is clear to anyone who has ever had any experience with any of these regulations that we're in clear violation of these laws. Suspend military assistance, condition military assistance to get to a ceasefire and stop protecting Israel politically and diplomatically. It's making us even more complicit in their violation of international law. Thank you, um, Hala. And I'll just add, you know, as an Israeli myself, Israeli-American myself, you'd mentioned emboldening extremism. And I will say that you'd mentioned Israeli protests swelling for release of hostages and a ceasefire. Uh, it's quite clear who uh, in power is being emboldened the most by the U.S. government at the moment, and those are precisely the most extremists we have ever seen in Israeli governance before. Um, I, I want to tell both of you it's been a great discussion, uh, and I thank you for sharing your, again, timely insights. I'd like now each panelist to share their closing thoughts in 60 seconds. Um, let's start with Harrison. Okay, first, two threats I forgot to mention. Another juicy target in the region is Saudi and other Gulf oil infrastructure. It's been attacked before. You can think about the political implications of oil prices going up. Second, uh, security consideration. Tens of thousands of American citizens that would need to be evacuated from Lebanon. We've done it before. It becomes very hard if we have a contested environment or Hezbollah is not acquiescing to us doing that. So think about those. Let me reiterate. Israel's not going anywhere, neither is Hamas, neither is Hezbollah, neither are the Houthis. Any plan that does not understand those facts is not grounded in reality. Just got to understand that regardless of what we'd like and regardless of our moral views. Uh, and, and finally, I just want to mention, you can draw your own parallels. We got where we are today because a, a very small group of advisors misestimated entirely the consequences and blowback of their policy and overestimated their ability to influence the actors involved. So, and everybody enabling them did not feel empowered or confident to tell them they were wrong. So I'll close it there. Maybe you can find some hope in that statement. Thank you, Harrison. Hala. Yeah, so tell them they're wrong is what Harrison is saying. <laughs> um, so I think that we've outlined 
a very bleak future reality of basically World War III. Uh, and we're not trying to be dramatic and we're not trying to be alarmists, but we're speaking from a place of deep experience of having worked and lived in the region of an understanding the ramifications of this policy. I'll add one more point. It's not just about the Middle East. This is a global issue. We, because we have lost credibility, we can no longer talk about Russia, Ukraine we can no longer compare ourselves to China in any way. You know, Russia has gained immense popularity throughout the Arab world, as has China, from this conflict. Uh, as a spokesperson, I was told, okay, you don't wanna do interviews on Gaza because you're worried about the blowback. Do interviews on Russia, Ukraine. We were massacred on Arab media when it comes to our double standard, why do you care about the life of a Ukrainian child, but you don't care about the life of a Palestinian child? This conflict to leverage its influence and its popularity across the Arab world. So even if, you know, if, if your members are not convinced by the humanitarian front, right? They're not, they're not moved in any way by the plight of the Palestinians. Okay, put that to the side. The national security threat. There is a direct target on our backs as Americans because of this policy. When the three service members died, when they were killed in Jordan, that was a result of this policy. And unfortunately, our concern and our fear is that more of that will happen. We cannot allow that to happen, right? It is a threat to us and we're hearing this from the highest levels of our intel chiefs, the highest levels, but the White House is not listening and is not changing the policy. So hopefully that will resonate with your members. If that also doesn't resonate with your members, then tell them about how we're losing to Russia and China and that we can no longer even talk about Russia, Ukraine or anything else for that matter uh, because our double standards are so glaring with this policy. Hopefully we've armed you with something um, to be able to help you. And we're always here for questions if you have more questions or concerns. Yeah. Um, so thank you both once again for joining us today. And thank you all for attending. If you have any follow-up questions for the panelists, please reach out to Kayvon at uh, Kayvon, which is C-A-V-A-N at demandprogress.org. Um, and please watch for a follow-up email with a recording of this briefing and invitations to future events in the series. We appreciate you coming today. Thank you.